This lecture is part of an online Galois theory course and will be about the hepta decagon or the regular hepta decagon. So hepta is seven and deca means ten, so this is a seventeen sided polygon. And one of Gauss's most famous early results was showing how to construct a 17-sided polygon using a ruler and compass. And of course, constructing a 17-sided polygon using ruler and compass is completely and utterly pointless, but it still gives a nice application of Galois theory. Incidentally, when I was checking heptadecagon, um, I tried looking at it on Google, and it claims there's a word called heptadecaphobia which, if you believe this, is apparently a morbid fear of heptadecagons. Um, there's a Wikipedia article that claims 17 is unlucky in southern European countries in the same way that 13 is unlucky in northern European countries. Um, I'm not quite sure whether this is some sort of weird Wikipedia hoax. I mean, they, they do have a picture of an Italian plane where, where, where the seat where, where row 17 of seats has been omitted, but for all I know this is some sort of weird scam by the aeroplane manufacturer to make their planes look bigger or something. Anyway, let's get back to Gauss. So, um, first of all, we, we recall that a number is constructible by ruler and compass is equivalent to saying you can construct it from the rational numbers using the field operations plus minus times divide and the square root operation. So, so we take the usual field operations and also allow taking square roots. Um, I'm not going to prove this. It's not too difficult if you know some Euclidean geometry. You, you first use analytic geometry to show that any number you construct by rule and compass can be defined using these operations. And conversely, you show that using a ruler and compass you can carry out these operations on lengths of lines. So we say a number is, we're going to use an algebraic definition of constructible just to say it's, it's constructible if you can write it using these. So 2 plus root 3 and then you take the square root of that minus 7 and plus the square root of 3 plus root 5 and so on would be a typical constructible number. Um, so um, at the moment this isn't terribly useful, so, so, so let's rephrase it a bit. So alpha is constructible if and only if alpha is contained in a normal extension of the rationals, of course, of degree 2 to the n for some n greater than or equal to 0. And um, the, this actually allows us to tell whether numbers are constructible because now we've reduced it to a problem about finite extensions which we which we can go around applying Galois theory to. So let's just quickly sketch the proof of this. So first of all, suppose alpha is constructible. Um, what this means is we can start with the rationals and then we ha have let's call this k0, and then we construct from that a field k1, which is the rationals, and then we adjoin the square root of some number alpha alpha 0 in, in k0. And then we can have a field k2, which is k root of alpha 1 for some alpha 1 in here. All these extensions are degree 2, and eventually we'll get up to kn, and our alpha is... Um, an element of Kn. So alpha is in an extension of degree 2 to the n. But this is not good enough because Kn need not be normal. And it's quite easy to see an example of this. In fact, I gave one earlier. All we do is take Q contained in Q the square root of 2 contained in Q with the square root of the square root of 2. And this is not a normal extension because it doesn't contain the complex square roots of 2. So, um, so this construction doesn't prove that alpha is in a normal extension of degree of power of 2. So, well, it's not too difficult to modify this. So we start off with Q, which is um, 
equal to k0, and then we take k1, which is k0 with alpha naught added. So we, we take the square root, sorry, the square root of something in alpha naught. And then we take k2. Um, we don't just take k1, the square root of alpha 1. We also adjoin the square root of all conjugates of alpha 1. Um, and so this is degree 2, and this is degree a power of 2. And similarly, um, when we take k3 to be an extension of 2, we take this as k2, and then we have the square root of alpha 2 and the square root of alpha 2 prime, square root of alpha 2 double prime, and so on, where these are all the conjugates of alpha 2. And this ensures that each of these extensions is indeed normal. And we obtain k2 from k1 by adding in a lot of square roots, and each of that doubles the degree, so, so, so this extension still has degree a power of 2. So we find that alpha is in a normal extension of degree a power of 2. It's important that we put normal here because there are lots of degree 4 extensions whose elements are not constructible because, I mean, you, you, you can't solve a, an arbitrary fourth degree polynomial just by using square roots, for example. Um, so that's shown that if alpha is constructible, it's in a normal extension. Now let's go back the other way. So let's suppose alpha is in a normal extension of degree 2 to the n for some n. Then we look at the Galois group G. And this is also has order 2 to the n. So it's a normal extension and we're characteristic 0, so it's a Galois extension and therefore its Galois group has can commit, it controls everything and has order 2 to the n. Now you recall any group of order 2 to the n is nil potent, so we can find this chain of subgroups, gn, gn, gn minus 1, gn minus 2, such that each is normal in the one before and um, each has index 2 in the previous one. And now we just look at the corresponding fields. So we have Q contained in um, K1, contained in K2, and so on, contained in Kn, um, and um, alpha is in here. And now each of these field extensions is degree 2. So K2, for example, um, over K1 is of order 2. And this means that k2 can be generated over k1 by taking the square root of something, because if we take some element alpha in k2, then it satisfies some, it, it's, it's a degree 2 extension, so it satisfies alpha squared plus a alpha plus b equals naught for a, b in k1, and then we can just apply the quadratic formula alpha is minus a plus or minus the square root of a squared minus 4b over 2. I should have used b and c, but never mind. And we're, we're not working characteristic 2, so we don't need to worry about dividing by 2. And we can see that k2 is generated by the square root of something over k1, and so on for all the others. So, so alpha in here is a constructible number. So that shows that um, a number can be constructed using square roots and field operations if and only if it's in a normal extension of degree 2 to the n. So, for example, we cannot construct a regular seven-sided polygon. Well, um, constructing a regular seven-sided polygon is more or less the same as constructing the number 2 pi over 7, um, or the cosine of 2 pi over 7, because if you take a, a regular seven-sided polygon, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, of a circle of radius 1, then this distance here is going to be cosine of 2 pi over 7, and constructing this distance is the same as constructing the polygon. And we've seen that this number here um, is a root of an irreducible degree 3 polynomial, whatever it was, 8x cubed plus 4x squared minus 4x minus 1, or something like that. Um, so, so any extension 
containing cosine of 2 pi over 7 has degree divisible by 3 by the multiplicative formula for degrees, so is not a power of 2. So, so this number here can't possibly be a constructible number and we can't construct a, a seven-sided polygon. Um, so um, now let's look at 17-sided polygons or more generally let's look at p-sided polygons. So we recall that um, constructing a p-sided polygon is more or less the same as constructing a, a, a piece root of unity. So, which it's a complex number, but when we say a complex number is constructible, we just mean it's real and imaginary parts are constructible, rather obviously. So we recall that x to the p minus 1 is not irreducible. If we divide it by x minus 1, we get x to the naught plus x to the 1 plus all the way up to x to the p minus 1. And we recall that this is irreducible. And the standard proof of this is you just change x to x plus 1 and invoke the magic word Eisenstein. And Eisenstein's criterion then implies that the polynomial is irreducible. Um, so suppose zeta is a pth root of unity, not equal to 1, so it might be cosine of 2 pi over 7 so cosine 2 pi over p plus i sine 2 pi over p, for example. Um, then we know the other roots of x to the 0 plus x to the 1 plus x to the p minus 1 are the other pth roots of unity. So they are zeta, zeta squared, zeta cubed, all the way up to zeta to the p minus 1. Um, so the extension q of zeta is normal because it contains all the other roots of this polynomial. It's, it's just the splitting field of this. And it's obviously separable because we're working in characteristic naught. So it's a Galois extension. Um, this is sometimes called a cyclotomic, cyclotomic extension. Um, Cyclotomic extensions are just extensions generated by roots of unity and they're incredibly important and they're the easiest sort of extension and we'll be talking about them a bit more later. So anyway, um, now we can work at its Galois group. Well, we sort of did this for p equals 7 earlier and the general case is rather similar. So we have an automorphism, must take zeta to zeta to the i for i in z modulo pz, a non-zero element of that. And the if we compose these, if we take zeta to the i to the j, this is just zeta to the i j. So the, the group operation is just multiplication. So, so this is the Galois group. And we can see it's the whole Galois group because we know the Galois group is order p minus 1. And here we found p minus 1 automorphism, so that, that, that's everything. Um, so, so we can now say, when, you, when can you construct a p-sided polygon? Well, this is equivalent to saying that q, sorry, q of zeta over q has degree a power of 2 by what we just said. We know it's a normal extension, so all we need for it to be constructed with it, that its degree of power is a power of 2. Well, the degree is just p minus 1. So p is equal to 1 plus 2 to the n for some n. And these are the famous Fermat primes. Um, Fermat showed that n itself must be a power of 2. So the Fermat primes are 2, 3, 5, um, 17, 257, 6, 5, 5, 3, 7. So the, um, the Greeks knew how to construct 
regular polygons with two, three, and five sides. You can find a construction of a regular pentagon in Euclid's Elements. Um, and 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years later, Gauss really amazed everybody by showing you could also construct regular polygons of this number of sides. Um, well, so far, um, we've got a... Um, We've got a rather abstract existence proof of a construction, but if you stop and actually try and use this, you'll discover that it's not very explicit. I mean, we've sort of claimed that we can write zeta in terms of square roots and rational numbers, so how do you actually write it down explicitly? And so um, what I'm going to do now is... Um, it show how we can give an explicit uh, description of zeta in terms of square roots. And for this we're going to use Galois theory. So let's just do it for p equals 17. Um, so we know the Galois group is, is um, z over 17z times, which is 1, 2, 3, up to 16. And we recall from number theory that this is cyclic because the non-zero elements mod p um, always form a cyclic group and a generator is called a primitive root. Um, it's, in fact, this is generated by the number 3. It's not too difficult to check. And since it's cyclic of order 16, it's got subgroups of order 1, 2, 4, 8 and 16. And let's write out these subgroups explicitly. We've got the subgroup 1. And then it's contained in the subgroup with 1 and 16. And then it's contained in the group with 1, 4, 13, 16. Which is contained in the group with 1, 2, 4, 8, 9, 13, 15, 16. Which is contained in the whole group. So here are the, here are the subgroups written out explicitly. And corresponding to these we get fields. We get a field Q of zeta which contains another field, which contains another field, which contains another field, which contains the rational numbers. And what we want to do is to figure out generators for these three fields explicitly and write each of them in terms of square roots, in terms of the other field. So first of all, what we want is, a, is, is an element um, in this field. This means it has to be fixed by this group here. So that's obvious. We just take zeta to the 1 plus zeta to the 16. Um, and this is 2 cosine 2 pi over 17, which is the number we wanted to construct. So there's not much to do there. Well, what you should do is you, you, you note that this group 1, 16 has various cosets. So let's write out all its cosets. So it's got cosets 1, 16, 2, 15, 3, 14, and so on. And when I said let's write them out, all, all of them, I didn't mean I was actually going to do that because I'm kind of lazy. And from that we see there are various other corresponding elements you can write down. There's zeta to the 1 plus zeta to the 16, zeta squared plus zeta to the 15, and so on. And these are all conjugates of zeta to the 1 plus zeta to the 16 under the Galois group. Let's call this element alpha. And we can do the same thing here. We can write out the cosets as 1, 4, 13, 16. And then another coset would be 2, 8, 9, 15. And another coset would be 3, 12, 5, 14. And the other one is 6, 7, 10, 11, if I've got them right. So there are four cosets. And here there are just two cosets. There's 1, 2, 4, 8, etc. And the other, and, and the other coset is 3, 5, um, 6, 7, etc. And again, for every coset, you can write down a corresponding sum over zeta. So here we have zeta to the 1 plus zeta to the 4 plus zeta to the 13 plus zeta to the 16. And here we have zeta squared plus zeta to the 8 plus zeta to the 9 plus zeta to the 15, and so on. I'm not going to write out the others. And, uh, you can see, imagine what those are. And um, let's call these elements things. So here's alpha and here's beta. Might be that one there. And these are all, the, these things here are the four conjugates of beta under, under, the full, uh, under the full Galois group. 
And what we can do now is we can write this number in terms of alpha rather easily because um, so we can write zeta in terms of alpha because you see that um, zeta squared minus zeta alpha plus one is equal to zero. So here we have a quadratic equation in zeta with coefficients in alpha. So zeta, we can write zeta explicitly in terms of alpha. So zeta is alpha um, minus um, the square root of um, alpha squared minus four over two and so on. And now we want to express alpha in, in, in terms of something. Well, we have a, a conjugate of alpha over this field here. Um, we can take conjugate of alpha to be alpha prime, which is zeta to the four plus zeta to the 13. And the reason for choosing four and 13 is because we then have alpha plus alpha prime is equal to beta. And you can work out that alpha times alpha prime is equal to one of the conjugates of beta. It's zeta to the five plus zeta to the 14 plus zeta cubed plus zeta to the 12, um, which is this one here. So we can express alpha plus alpha prime and alpha times alpha prime in terms of explicit elements of this field. So we have this quadratic equation for alpha. Alpha squared plus something times alpha plus something is equal to zero, where the something and the something are both explicit elements of this field. And now we can do exactly the same for these elements. We can take um, this element here and we will find that this element plus this element is equal to this element here. And this element times this element will equal something here. So we can get an explicit quadratic equation for beta. And similarly, if gamma is this element here, we can get an explicit um, um, expression for gamma. In fact, you find gamma is equal to um, um, the square root of 17 minus 1 over 2 if you want to do it explicitly and check your answer. So we can get a whole series of quadratic equations, each expressing an element of this field in an element of the next field. And if you unravel that all, you find an explicit expression for um, cosine of 2 pi over 17 in terms of square roots. Um, writing it out explicitly is a little bit of a mess. I'm not going to do so. Um, because Gauss has already done it. Um, so this is Gauss's famous book on number theory, Disquisitiones Arithmeticae. And if you go almost to the end, so it's about two or three pages from the end. Let me sort of magnify this so you can see. Uh, oops, I've overshot a bit. Um, right here, we have Gauss's expression for the cosine of the angle P over 17. And P is Gauss's notation for 2 pi. So, so cos here's cosine of 2 pi over 17 expressed um, in terms of repeated square roots of numbers. You see there's the square root of 17 turning up all the time and so on. Um, so um, um, so uh, I guess that's enough about heptadecagons. Um, next lecture, we'll be doing some other applications of Galois theory. In particular, I'll be giving an algebraic proof that the complex numbers are algebraically closed.